Welcome to this video, Resource Reliance, a summary um, from OCRB Geography for Inquiring Minds. So this video looks at um, the second geography paper, People and Society, and you can see it's the fourth topic. So it's the question number four in your exam. And we're going to look at um, whether we're going to run out of resources, so looking at supply and demand of, of um, food, energy and water, and how we can feed 9 billion people by 2050. Your case study for this unit is Tanzania. Reminding you that our YouTube videos are on the CVS Geography channel. So resources we know are a supply of something like money or materials that people use. Some resources are essential for survival, whilst others are needed to maintain a standard of living. So one resource that we obviously really need is food. An average person needs to consume between 2,000 and 2,500 calories a day. The actual number of calories needed depends on things like age, gender, height and level of activity. Eating too few calories causes weight loss and a lack of energy. People who do not have enough food to eat find it difficult to work. If there are too many people in the country who are unable to work, then that country will obviously lose a lot of money. Regularly consuming more calories than are burned causes weight gain. People who eat too many calories for a sustained period of time can also find it difficult to work. Power stations convert primary industry energy into electricity. Energy has many uses. It heats homes and offices, cooks food and powers transport. Much of the energy that uses in the form of electricity. So this is called secondary energy. Energy. Primary energy sources like fossil fuels or the wind have been used as a fuel to generate it. Energy affects both food supplies and industry. Mining and growing biofuels required to generate energy takes up valuable farmland, which reduces the amount of food available for us to eat. And if energy is more expensive or in short supply, then it costs more to produce and transport food, which is the case at the moment. This is therefore passed on to consumers through an increase in the price of food. Looking at water, irrigation enables crops to grow. That's the unnatural watering of crops. People can't live without clean, safe drinking water. Water makes up about two thirds of a person's body. It's needed for the body to function, to absorb nutrients and to get rid of waste. Each person should drink a minimum of 1.6 to 2 litres of water a day. The actual amount of water needed depends on factors such as the air temperature and the type of activity that a person undertakes each day. Water is also used to keep people clean and healthy and is needed to grow food and for industry. In drier countries or drier seasons, irrigation enables crops to grow. Industry uses water in many ways, like cleaning, cooling, and as a raw material in production. So looking at this unequal balance of the supply and demand of natural resources, so food, water, and energy are resources that help to maintain social and economic well-being. Their production and consumption is not equally spread between countries. The UK has reserves of each type. But there are inequalities in the global distribution of resources, the balance between the supply and demand for resources affect a country's wealth and security. So food security is when people have enough nutritious and affordable food to eat. And food insecurity is obviously when people go hungry or suffer from malnutrition. Wealthier countries like us import food and subsidised farming to make food more affordable. This creates a food surplus and there is plenty of food to go around. Poorer countries have a food deficit. They struggle to grow enough to feed people and cannot afford to subsidise farming or import more food. So there's a fixed amount of water on the planet. Some is stored in the oceans and ice caps and some circulates as the water supply. The amount of water available in an area is dependent on factors like rainfall temperature and population. Higher rainfall leads to more water. Some places can have too much rainfall, which leads to flooding, and higher temperatures cause evaporation. And if water evaporates, then less is available for people to use. Higher populations use more water. This means that there's less available to share, and areas of water surplus have more water than they actually need. Excess water flows along rivers and out into the sea, but can become a problem if it floods the land. 
areas of water deficit have too little water. So around 80% of the global population experiences water insecurity. That is an incredible figure. Water supply and consumption are not evenly distributed. So the UK has an overall water surplus, although there are variations in the amount of water rainfall across the country. So, for example, in places in the West, like us, we receive much more rainfall than those in the East. There are also variations in the population density, like the Southeast has a much higher population density than Wales, which is in the West. So we have um, water transfer schemes, um, which transport water from areas of surplus to areas of deficit. So water transfer schemes use canals and pipes to move water. There are lots of disadvantages though to this. They damage ecosystem, put pressure on local ecosystems. Lots of energy is used to pump the water long distances, and they often involve building dams and reservoirs. Looking at energy security, advanced countries and emerging and developing countries consume a lot of energy. The people living in these countries are usually connected to a national electricity grid like us. They use a lot of techn technology in their lives and have a high standard of living. Batteries and EDCs also use energy to manufacture products. Low-income developing countries use less energy. Many people living in LIDCs are not connected to an electricity grid, but they rely on primary energy sources such as fuel wood or animal dung. Some countries provide large supplies of energy. They may have fossil fuel reserves or access to other energy sources like geothermal heat, so heat generated from underneath the ground. Other countries are dependent upon imported fuel. Fuel prices are set by the exporting countries, and so those importing fuel often have to pay high prices. Places that have energy security produce a higher percentage of the energy that they consume. Places that have energy insecurity consume more than they produce. Energy security is determined by that balance between the amount of energy produced and energy imported from abroad. So let's have a look at natural resources, the supply and the demand. The world's rapidly growing population is consuming the planet's natural resources at an alarming rate. The Global Footprint Network estimates that the world currently needs 1.6 Earths to satisfy the demand for natural resources and suggests that this figure could rise to two planets by 2030. The highest levels of resource consumption obviously are found in advanced countries. And if everyone in the world lived the lifestyle of Americans, five planets would be needed. Although many advanced countries are beginning to take steps to reduce their consumption, emerging and developing countries are continuing to industrialize and consume more. So why is demand outstripping supply? High and increasing levels of consumption in advanced countries as incomes rise, people can afford to purchase the items they consider essential to improve their quality of life. Newly and emerging develop and developing countries are in industrializing at a rapid rates. So they're using more. LIDCs are developing their economies and increasing wealth and consumer demands. They want more too. Uneven distribution of global resources can affect the supply and reflect political barriers. Many natural resources are not renewable, like fossil fuels. The degradation of some natural resources, e.g. water quality, leads to them being unusable. And then you've got this population explosion. There are contrasting views on how rapid population growth can affect natural resources. So let's have a look at those. The first one is Malthus's theory. He examines the relationship between population and food production suggesting that while population grows geometrically, i.e. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, food production increases arithmetically, i.e. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Eventually, this leads to population outstripping food production, leaving much of the world hungry. So you reach this point of crisis. You can see the green line population that's exploding, and the red line is increasing arithmetically. Bozerup came, though, much later in 1965, and she suggested a different argument. Her theory was based on the idea that population growth has a positive impact on people as it forces them to invent new methods to obtain more food when supplies begin to run out. So this technological fix, it follows the idea of necessity is the mother of invention and might refer to developments like the Green Revolution, genetically modified crops and irrigation systems. 
Now, there are lots of environmental impacts of meeting these resource demands. We've got intensive agriculture using lots of chemicals. We've got increased mechanization, removing hedges, overfishing, disturbing marine ecosystems, the clearing of rainforests, obviously, for new farmland, causing soil erosion and desertification. You've got globalization of food, raising atmospheric CO2 levels due to increased distances of food transport. Rainforests are destroyed for fuel supplies. Mining of fossil fuels creates environmental scars, which never heal. Water transfer systems create large reservoirs, which flood vast areas of countryside. Wetland habitats are drained to provide new farmland. Farm practices like overgrazing and monoculture, only producing one crop, can lead to soil erosion. So to conserve natural resources for future generations, sustainable management of the natural environment is necessary. So let's have a look at global food supply. We can illustrate the world pattern of access to food in different ways using the Global Hunger Index and the global calorie consumption, which you can see in the bottom right. So this map of global calorie consumption shows that sub-Saharan African nations consume fewer calories than other countries. The staple food for many of these countries is corn, wheat, and rice. European and North American countries consume more calories than other nations. Many of these countries eat more animal products like meat, milk, and eggs. So the map of global calorie consumption shows that sub-Saharan African nations consume more, as I've said, than other countries. This is just repeating that slide, apologies. So let's have a look at the Global Hunger Index. This is calculated by the International Food Policy Research Institute. It measures world hunger. Each country is given a score between zero, which is no hunger, to 100, which is when everyone is hungry. And three things are used to calculate this score. Undernourishment, so the percentage of people consuming too few calories. The percentage of children underweight, so the number of children below the age of five who are underweight or wasting away, and child mortality, the death rate of children below the age of five. So it's used to target security needs. And you can see that there is a map here. And obviously, the red shows the percentage of total undernourished, um, thirty-five, more than 35%. So there are lots of factors affecting food security. Some places produce more food than others. <clears throat> so you have physical factors like climate, soil quality, and topography, and human factors like technology. These have historically controlled the quantity and type of food produced in any location. Today, though, there are many other factors that explain why some countries produce more food than others. So the first one is climate. Global warming is increasing temperatures by around 0.2 degrees every 10 years. Rainfall is increasing in some places, but decreasing in others. Higher temperatures and unreliable rainfall make farming difficult, especially for those farming marginal lands who already struggle to survive. Even advanced countries can be affected by drought. Countries like Russia and Australia are huge exporters of wheat and barley, respectively. When they suffer drought, there is less food available globally, and global food prices increase, leaving the poor most vulnerable. The next one is technology. Improvements in technology have increased the amount of food available. Technology can overcome temperature, water, and nutrient deficiencies in the form of greenhouses, irrigation, and fertilizers. This can incur an economic or environmental cost, though. Advanced countries import food from across the globe all year round. And then loss of farmland. The growth of the biofuel market is taking up valuable farmland, which is then not used, obviously, for food. So there are other factors too, pests and diseases. Pesticides have increased crop yields and farmers in advanced countries can afford these, whereas most farmers in LIDCs can't. Then you've got water stress. Irrigation systems provide water for countries with unreliable or low rainfall. Irrigation can double crop yields, but it's expensive to put these systems in place. Water can be taken either from underground aquifers, underground reservoirs, or directly from rivers. Both have environmental consequences. The next one is conflict. War forces farmers to flee their land or to fight in conflict. Food can be used as a weapon, with enemies cutting off food supplies in order to gain ground. Crops can also be destroyed during fighting, like they have in the Ukraine. 
Food shortages have caused riots and conflict. The South Sudan region has faced conflict for years, with 4 million people facing insecurity. In the Defer, in the Defer area, conflict has lasted years because of disagreement over land and grazing rights. And poverty, when people have less money, they cannot afford food and they become unable to work. Families in developing countries spend much of their money on food. So let's have a look at the impacts. There are obviously quite a few. Food security is when the entire population of a country has access to enough safe and nutritious food to maintain an active life. Obviously, we know the opposite is food insecurity. So some impacts are famine, undernourishment, malnutrition, and wasting is the most serious type of hunger. It is severe weight loss due to acute malnutrition resulting from starvation. The next one is soil erosion. The removal of soil occurs more rapidly in areas that are very dry. Food insecurity can lead to soil erosion as farmers try to get more out of their land. Deforestation, overgrazing and overcultivation. Rising prices. Debt. So food prices can be set by speculators in advanced countries and it can cause great swings in the prices offered to farmers for their crops. Obviously, fair trade is an alternative to this and social unrest. So here are some strategies to increase food security. As the global population continues to increase, countries are finding ways to grow more food through irrigation. This can double the amount of food produced. Some parts of the world still, though, do not have irrigation systems. Only 10% of the food produced in Africa comes from irrigated crops, so there's potential to improve yields in these countries. Aeroponics and hydroponics, the systems that allow plants to be grown without soil. Plants grown in this way take in water and nutrients efficiently. These methods are also good for countries where soil erosion or poor quality soil is an issue, but they are really expensive. Aeroponics involves suspending plants in the air, you saw it on the video, and spraying their roots with a fine mist of water and nutrients. And hydroponics involves growing plants in a porous mat material, not soil, and allowing water containing nutrients to filter through it. We also learned about the New Green Revolution, which began in the 1940s, and it refers to the application of modern farming techniques in LIDCs, like fertilizers and pesticides. Um, we looked at golden rice. From the 1960s to 1990s, yields of rice and wheat in Asia doubled, but also produced economic and social problems for small-scale farmers. But many LIDCs could still benefit from the Green Revolution. And then you have biotechnology and appropriate technology, which is the selective breeding or genetic modification of plants and animals to produce specific features and adaptations. Both involve mixing two species, both of which have beneficial characteristics. For example, selective breeding has been used on dairy cows to increase milk yields. GM has been used on wheat to produce crops that are disease resistant. Appropriate technology involves using suitable machinery and sustainable techniques in LIDCs. It's usually affordable and easy to use and can improve yields. A hand-operated nutshelling machine, for example, is an example of appropriate technology. It's affordable, easy to use, fast and simple to maintain, and it saves time. And people can then afford to shell their own dried crops and adds value to the product when they sell it. Now, there's been a demand for organic produce. Organic foods are grown without using any chemicals. They use natural fertilizers like animal manure and natural predators instead of chemical pesticides. The consumption of organic produce has, give, has risen, though, in the UK as fewer people are prepared to eat food that has been sprayed with harsh chemicals. When farmland is converted to become organic, yields are usually lower than those from inorganic crops, but the difference varies between the types of crops and over time. Organic farms are thought to be environmentally sustainable in that they don't use artificial chemicals. Some people believe that organic farming is unsustainable as it can lead to a greater use of farmland. And then you have ethical consumerism, which is the purchase of products and services that have been provided in a way that minimizes social and environmental damage. Might include food and drink, travel or travel plans or financial services. Fair trade ensures that producers, usually farmers, receive a fair price for their goods too. And local food sourcing is a method of food production and distribution that is local rather than national or international. 
Food is produced close to consumers and then distributed over much shorter distances, reducing food miles. And it's supported by the growing trend of farmers' markets. Then you have sustainable agricultural approaches like permaculture, which means permanent agriculture. It refers to the way that the crops are planted and the soils are managed so that they can be used indefinitely, like in layers. And then you have urban gardens. We would think of those as allotments. These are city gardens or community gardens. They're formal projects where individuals or small cooperatives work together to grow food and promote healthy eating. Thank you so much for listening. Obviously, re-watch the video, pause it where you need to, and enjoy your exam. Good luck.